Churchill biographer Andrew Liddell. What do we think about Churchill? Saint or sinner? We'll discuss that after 10. Big guests, big stories and always big opinions. A lively two hours to come. But first, the headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Good evening. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. A major incident has been declared in Dorset after the equivalent of 200 barrels of oil and saline solution spilt into Pool Harbour this morning. Pool Harbour commissioners say the leak came from a pipeline leading into the Witch Farm onshore processing facility. The pipeline has been shut down and the oil has been contained. Members of the public are being advised not to swim in the harbour or the surrounding area. Offenders who commit antisocial behaviour will be forced to clean up their communities as part of the Prime Minister's new immediate justice scheme. Under the plans to be announced tomorrow, local authorities will be given new powers to quickly and visibly punish criminals. Those who spray graffiti or commit other vandalism will have to fix the damage within 48 hours. Other penalties include picking up litter and washing police cars. Well, as part of the crackdown, the government has also announced a ban on the sale of laughing gas. Levelling up Secretary Michael Gove told broadcasters nitrous oxide canisters are helping to fuel antisocial behaviour and turning public spaces into, quote, drug-taking arenas. England has beaten Ukraine 2-0 in their Group C Euro qualifier match. Both teams joined for a photograph before the game as players clutched a Ukrainian flag with peace written across it. The FA had given 1,000 free tickets to Ukrainian refugees and their British hosts to attend the game. First half goals from Harry Kane and Bukayo Saka were enough to seal the win. Teams will face off again in September. Tensions have heightened between Russia and Ukraine, with the country's state media saying a blast in the Tula region was caused by a Ukrainian drone packed with explosives. Three people were reportedly injured when they were struck by shrapnel. However, Ukraine has not so far claimed responsibility for the alleged attack. It follows pleas from the European Union for Russia to halt the stationing of nuclear weapons in Belarus. Kyiv's foreign ministry has called the decision provocative and is calling for a session of the UN Security Council. And the US president has declared a state of emergency in Mississippi after a tornado killed at least 26 people. The twister swept through the state and on into Alabama, cutting a path of destruction 170 miles long. Around 11,000 residents there have been without power. They say there was no safe place to hide. We're on TV, online, on DAB Plus Radio and, of course, on TuneIn too. This is GB News. Back now to Mark Dolan. My thanks to Ray Addison, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, whisper it, folks, the Tories might just win the next general election. Will Rishi Sunak defy the odds next year? My verdict on that shortly. In the big story, with rows over some MPs charging eye-watering amounts for so-called consultancy services this week, we'll be asking, should MPs be paid more to discourage second jobs? Are they underpaid? What do you think? My Mark Meets guest is the top historian who's written a stunning new biography about Winston Churchill. Was our greatest Briton a sinner or a saint? We will get the definitive answer. In my take at 10, Prince Andrew, we're told, is considering writing a tell-all book. Have the British public not suffered enough? I'll be reacting to that one and I won't be pulling my punches. In fact, I might get sent to the tower. Tonight's newsmaker, will the government crack down on antisocial behaviour work? We'll be speaking to former Home Office Minister, the star of Mark Dolan Tonight, every Sunday, Anne Widdicombe. Mark Dolan Tonight is the home of the papers, with tomorrow's front pages at exactly 10.30 sharp. With three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome, look at the pedigree this evening, journalist and broadcaster Angela Epstein making... Her first appearance on Mark Dolan tonight, legendary news broadcaster and author Michael Crick, and leadership coach, author and social commentator Adrian Hayes. 
Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits after Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham is fined for speeding, should politicians be held to a higher standard? Also, should landlords be limited to the number of properties they can own? And does Agatha Christie need a woke makeover? You can guess my answer to that one, but we'll debate it with the panel shortly. Plus your emails, even the spicy ones, mark at gbnews.uk. Now, this programme has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. So let's get to work and we start with my big opinion. I've been saying for a long time that shares in Keir Starmer are too high and that shares in Rishi Sunak are too low and it's beginning to show in the polls. Hardly surprising that the current government that's seen three new prime ministers in what feels like the last 10 minutes, and one which is presiding over a cost of living crisis and suffering the aftermath of a sleaze scandal should be behind the opposition. But old Sunak has narrowed the gap with the latest Delta poll survey revealing the Tories are up eight points to 35 and are closing in on Labour. I think Keir Starmer's worst nightmare is beginning to play out, which is that the change that Britain needed following the mercurial premiership of Boris Johnson has happened already without the need for an election. It turns out that Sunak was the change candidate all along. He has changed economic course, aided by the reassuringly boring Jeremy Hunt. These two have won back the trust of the international bond markets, upon whose largesse we are now so reliant. The cost of government borrowing has come down, and notwithstanding an unexpected jump this month, inflation should be down to 2.9% by the end of the year. Sunak has also been willing to change the crowd-pleasing approach of the previous incumbent but one, Boris Johnson, by sticking with an unpopular policy of raising corporation tax. It may or may not be the right thing to do, but the messaging, which seems to be a big part of Sunak's recent success, is that he's willing to make the tough choices and is willing to be unpopular, not something you could say about Bojo. Sunak is pitching himself as the change candidate on illegal migration as well. Following a deal with the French to build a massive migrant facility on French soil, which was widely seen as a win for Sunak, and a facility which, yes, will cost us millions, but will cost the French even more. It shows that the obstinate French can be collaborative in the right hands. And so far, Sunak's premiership has been characterised by tangible action and attention to detail. Again, a welcome change from the last guy. The Windsor framework, the so-called Brexit breakthrough, legislation to stop illegal immigration and the threat of tearing up the European Convention on Human Rights to unlock the Rwanda plan. Sunak is all about delivery. But Sunakism is about messaging too. Stabilise the economy, make Brexit work, fix the NHS and, of course, stop the boats. Now, the public aren't stupid and know that the migrant crisis is a deeply complex one and they won't expect miracles but the Tories are owning this story ahead of Labour. And if anything, the Gary Lineker soap opera helped the Conservatives, with Starmer once again showing a wild lack of political judgment by backing a privileged, virtue-signalling millionaire ex-footballer over Red Wall voters concerned about legal immigration and who not unreasonably want something done. The migrant crisis is a humanitarian, economic and national security disaster and tackling it could decide and dictate the outcome of the next election. Stop the boats is the new get Brexit done. And on this issue, Labour are out to sea. Then there's the, uh, the brilliant AUKUS deal with Australia and the United States, of course, reaffirming Britain's position as a military superpower. There's progress on the widespread industrial action, the government having stood their ground to the union barons, but with deals for nurses, train workers ambulance drivers and junior doctors, hopefully in the offing. And then there is the presidential factor. Should the next election be decided around the idea of who leads Britain rather than which party, I think, again, it's potentially a win for Sunak. 
The 60-year-old Starmer is not without his talents. And his steady-as-she-goes persona and his forthright efforts to detoxify the Labour Party from the scourge of anti-Semitism deserve great credit. And he has made Labour far, far more electable. But compared to the young, thrusting Sunak, who has a twinkle in his eye, it's my view that Starmer looks a bit tired, dusty, old and puffy by comparison. Yes, the Tories have got more skeletons in their closet than Count Dracula. And post-Brexit and post-Boris, as a party, they still need to properly unite. That is not a done deal by any stretch. But the public won't quickly forget that the alternative, Keir Starmer, campaigned for a Corbyn government, campaigned to reverse Brexit, and still, to this day, will not go on record and define what a woman actually is. Why? Because he's got no balls. So it's all to play for next year. Anything could happen. And Mrs Sunak might just be measuring up for new curtains at number 10 after all. That's if the Tories can pull themselves together. You think this show is all about your opinions? Supporters of Labour would argue that the Tories have destroyed the economy and in 13 years have been asleep at the wheel when it comes to the delivery of public services. Labour would point to a sustained lead in the polls as evidence Britain is ready for change. And they would argue that the migrant crisis has happened on the Conservatives' watch and they're serious about tackling it. So what do you think? Mark at gbnews.uk. Get me uh, your emails in as soon as you can. Let's get reaction from my wonderful panel tonight. Top columnist and broadcaster Angela Epstein, legendary news journalist Michael Crick, and leadership coach, author and social commentator Adrian Hayes. Angela Epstein, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on the show. Uh, do you think that shares in Rishi Sunak are too low at the moment? Yeah, I think certainly he's bringing a whole energetic breeze back into the Conservative Party. We've had the fiasco of Liz Truss. I think the whole issue with the with the uh, inquiry into Bo Boris and Partygate at the moment, it, even though that may drag on until September when, when the committee reaches its verdict and then it has to be voted upon, I think that's business which is going to be done. I think for all the things that, that you've listed, uh, where he's shown... He's sort of stuck his head above the parapet and said, no, I mean to do business, and I hold up my hands. I thought he was a lightweight at the beginning. I also didn't like the Brutus light where he, he wielded the knife with Boris which triggered the whole uh, event, chain of events that led to his, his departure uh, from the, the office of Prime Minister. But I think there's an awful lot there that people who are now undecided... Remember, people may have become disenfranchised from the Tory party, but that doesn't necessarily mean they went over to Labour. They might go to the Reform Party, they might decide they're not going to vote at all. So there's that kind of whole floating body of voters who may well come back now that he's showing so much energy in what he's doing. I mean, things like, the, you know, blocking the, 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 um, the gender bill in Scotland. You know, he's... he's, yeah. he's Effectively precipitating the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon. Yes, the gender recognition bill was something that a lot of politicians, you know, as he said, may not have had the balls to touch, mm. um, if that's not an unfortunate analogy. Um, and uh, also... I see that now. No, I don't really <laughs> want to think about that one. Um, but also, you know, the strikes, he's showing his mettle there. Mm. Uh, he's not given in automatic and rolled over to the unions. So I think if we're looking for some energy and, and leadership, then, yeah, maybe the, his, his stock should be higher. What do you think, Michael Crick? I just wonder whether Keir, uh, Rishi Sunak's short tenure at number 10 has been characterised by two things, delivery and strong messaging. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of truth in what you said in your monologue. And I think the analogy really is when John Major took over from Margaret Thatcher, you remember way back in 1990, and Thatcher and that government were deeply unpopular, mm. and Major turned it round in 18 months. A grey figure... Uh, a serious figure, though, and that's what we've got with Sunak, compared with both Truss and Johnson uh, before him. Um, and he, he had, the Conservatives, actually, in 1992, got more votes uh, than in any, any party had ever got in an election, more than uh, 14 million, even though the majority was small. Now, the big problem this time for Sunak is the economy. I mean, we know growth is... There isn't really going to be any growth this year. Uh, inflation... OK, it's predicted to be 2.9 by the end of the year, but that prediction was made before last month's <laughs> inflation went up rather than down. So I think that is a bit of an optimistic prediction on the government's part. And, and that could carry on uh, well into next year. And when the economy is going badly, people tend not to like the government. 
And, of course, they will be constantly reminded by the fiasco of the Johnson regime and all the appalling things that went on in Downing Street and parties and so on. And we will not just get the reminders with the report, as Angela says, uh, but then there's the whole question of whether there's going to be a, a vote in Parliament, then a possible by-election, and then Boris Johnson wins or loses it, and then will he go and look for a new seat? So Boris Johnson is going to be but constantly reminding us of his <laughs> disastrous government. Isn't and... Rishi Sunak the fix for party gates and, well, it, and the sleaze? Possibly, possibly. But I think that every, every now and then, about every ten years in politics, events are so traumatic that they mm. scar voters in a way that most political events don't. And people say, right, the Conservatives, never again. Now, um, I'm not... I, I think that's probably the case here. And it may well be that you actually end up with um, nobody winning an outright majority. I think um, the most likelihood is that Labour will win an outright... They will get a... will be the biggest party, but without a majority. And in those circumstances, Labour will have the advantage because nearly all the other parties in Parliament are likely to vote for a Labour Prime Minister, with the exception of the DUP, the Lib Dems would, the Nationalists would, uh, whatever, how many Greens there are, only one at the moment, they would. And so the, I think the likely outcome is you will get a Starmer uh, government. But I don't think it's at all certain. A lot depends on Scotland, of course, because we don't know whether the demise of Nicola Sturgeon means the demise of the, N the SNP. I mean, after all, at the moment, Labour's only got one seat in Scotland and the Labour Party is, you know, next to dead, frankly, in Scotland. Well, that, it may be re revived. It will partly depend on who is elected leader tomorrow. So there's so many imponderables here. But I wouldn't write off the Conservatives. They ha you've, uh, Finally, the Conservatives got a serious politician and a serious Chancellor of the Exchequer, whereas uh, there were so many joke figures over the last few years. Well, I just wonder, and I think Michael's raised a good point, if it's about the branding of the parties and the reputation of the parties, then Labour win all day long. But if our system has become presidential, I think it's Sunak's to take. Well... My view, firstly, I, I, Michael and Angela asked them, where do you sit on the political spectrum? I say, I sit, I sit nowhere. I'm politically homeless. And why I say that? Because I, there's parts of the left side of things. In fact, I think the left versus right divide is, in it, is, is finished. We're now on an up top versus bottom. But I think there are so many people now that are politically homeless that I think people will vote with their hearts more than ever before. Because the Conservatives have always relied, you know, if you don't vote for us, you're going to get a Labour government in. When most people think that Labour's going to win anyway, I think people will vote with their hearts. I think the smaller parties will be far more, far bigger than they have been in the past. Now, that won't change the results of this election, but it could be very interesting one after this. So, I, I, as I said, I think, and I think one of the things... And we've seen the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon. I think the culture wars and the progressives, the elites versus the common people, progressives versus the common sense, I think that is going to become one of the main defining factors. You know, Mark, I, I work abroad a lot. The rest of the world, Middle East, Asia Pacific, is laughing at us with our culture wars and our gender ID and our, all this stuff. And I think a politician who's brave enough to be like a Ron DeSantis, whatever political party he's on, Starmer's milked it down, Sturgeon got kicked out from it. I think that could be a defining factor for the silent majority of this, of this country. There you go, an interesting point. The culture wars, will they be a factor? Have, have the Tories turned the corner? What do you think? Mark at gbnews.uk. A very busy show tonight coming up in The Big Story. Should MPs be paid more to discourage second jobs? We'll debate that with top Telegraph columnist Tim Stanley and former Conservative government minister Lord Lilly. See you in two. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are <laughs> those days are gone. I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. Now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, a big reaction to my big opinion. I think there's a chance the Tories could win the next election. Uh, let's get the views of Dave. Mark, it's so obvious you are centre-left from your views on Rishi and Boris. Slippery Rishi will never be forgiven for what they did to Boris. We voted for Boris for five years in 2019. He's the reason Rishi can get anything done in Parliament. Thank you for that, Dave. Uh, Graham says, uh, hi, Mark. People have always voted for leaders over a party. Thatcher, Blair and Boris for a start. Not sure Sunak is in that league, though, but I'm prepared to give him a chance. Uh, and last but not least for now, this is from Alan. Good evening, Alan. Thanks for your email. Alan says, Mark, yes, the country is looking for change. However, I doubt if either Sunak or Starmer are the answer. In, in the next election, it will be a choice for the least worst option. OK, well, look, we'll get to more of your emails shortly. Mark at gbnews.uk. It's time now for the big story in which we tackle a major news issue of the day. Tonight, uh, with the problem of parliamentarians' second jobs yet again hitting the headlines after two high-profile former ministers were caught charging eye-watering rates for services to a non-existent political consultancy firm, we're asking, should MPs be paid more to discourage second jobs? To discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome the former deputy leader of the Conservative Party, former Cabinet Minister as well for the Conservatives, Lord Peter Lilly, and the brilliant Telegraph <coughs> columnist and historian Tim Stanley. Tim, uh, does this sting prove that MPs are underpaid? No, certainly not. And if their hourly or daily rates they were quoting to the person claiming to be a consultant were anything accurate, then I would suggest there, actually, there is such a thing as too much money and they hope to make it. I, I found it extraordinary the amounts of money that were being quoted. I know it doesn't sound like a very conservative thing to say there's too much money, but I think there probably is actually. I'm not against second jobs in principle. Part of the problem with this whole debate is that when you say to people, should MPs have second jobs, they usually think of those kind of consultancy fees, which are grotesque and big, and no one can get their head around what the MP is actually doing in order to get that money. But what about someone who's a doctor in their spare time? What about people who during the pandemic were going back to their constituencies to help out in the NHS? We're all for that. I, I have no problem at all with MPs having a hinterland, with having an additional income. The problem with this sting was it just looked tawdry. And we all know that the reason why uh, those sorts of ex-ministers can command consultancy fees, if indeed they do, one has to be careful, is because they are essentially selling their experience. The public invested in them. The public made them famous. It gave them that experience. 
then they're selling it on to a private company. And I just don't think that feels quite right. Peter Lilly, what's your view on this? Perhaps we should pay MPs more, but not allow them to have a second job. I take the reverse view. I think it's desirable that MPs have a second job. It makes them more independent of the whips. It gives them a foot in the real world. It will tend to attract more um, worthwhile candidates, people who've got proper jobs rather than just full-time politicians. Uh, and I always had some outside interest for a lot of the time, of course, it was being a minister. No one thinks that that's odd, that you spend much of your time in your department and you're paid extra for it. Uh, it's up to the electorate whether they like what you're delivering as an MP. And if you fail to deliver because you spend all your time either playing golf or working for some consultancy in uh, Abu Dhabi or something, then they'll take it out on you. But it's the MPs, it's the constituents, the voters who should make that choice and not some uh, legislature or uh, some uh, regulator of, of what MPs do. Now, Peter Lilly, I will agree with you that it's desirable that politicians have some kind of professional hinterland, that they've got a career, they've made something of their lives before <coughs> entering Parliament. But is it too much to ask that they concentrate for their working hours in representing 60 or 70,000 constituents. Why isn't that a full-time job? Well, that's up to their constituents. Uh, I certainly, I remember I was challenged at one uh, election meeting by my, one of my opponents who said if he was elected, he'd be a full-time MP. Uh, unlike me, who worked so many hours a month doing something else and earned so much, which he said worked out at, I forget what it was, but in today's money, a thousand pounds an hour, if only, but I just said, well, you all know I work 50 or 60 hours a week for you, uh, which means you're getting 50 or 60 hours at a thousand pounds an hour. That's 50,000 pounds worth of my time a week. Why should it worry if you, I spend some time on, in addition to that, uh, on the board of a company or uh, consulting for some uh, enterprise that wants to invest in this country or whatever. And they all cheered and said, uh, yeah, that's right, we prefer that. But it's up to the voters to make this decision. It's not up to you, me, or some standards commissioner to decide it. Tim Stanley, I just wonder whether we should consider paying MPs something in the region of 200 or 250,000 pounds, but just say no second job and you will represent constituents. Right. Well, we're back in the debate about welfare versus tax. Why is it whenever we deal with welfare and the poor, we always punish them to make them work harder? Whenever it comes to the rich and tax or uh, salaries like this, we feel we have to bribe them to work harder. We shouldn't have to do that. If nothing else, there is supposed to be a, a sense uh, of vocation about being an MP, that you should wish to do the job and dedicate yourself to it because you wish to be part of public service. Uh, now, there are some countries like Singapore, which pay something like £500,000 a year to their MPs. They've taken the view that they do need to bribe people, need to get the best of the best. Other countries don't do that. But don't, don't run away with the idea that MPs in this country are in some way underpaid. Uh, in, it was about 1911 that we started paying our MPs, and they were paid £400 a year, which works out to between thirty to £40,000 today. That's, a, that's you know, a, a reasonable middle-class salary. Well, it's essentially doubled since then. MPs are doing okay. They very often have to maintain second homes. There are problems with expenses. There are many stresses and strains on an MP's life, such as what happens to them when they lose their job. And there probably isn't enough being done to support them. A lot of Tory MPs are going to go through that in the next couple of years. So that there are ways of making being an MP's life easier. But I would still stress the vocational element and don't run away with this idea that MPs are paupers, because they're really not compared to the rest of us, certainly. Although, Tim Stanley, the public won't take kindly to that footage of the likes of Kwasi Kwarteng pitching his services to a non-existent Korean business. No, they won't. And it was very amusing to watch because uh, in the course of Kwasi realising that there was more money on the table than he realised, uh, his daily or hourly rate seemed to go up very suddenly. Uh, it, was, it was very amusing to watch him adjust to that. The funny thing, I, I haven't watched the entire expose. I'm not sure it's all been released yet, but from the trailer that I saw, the striking thing about it was that the person setting up this fake consultancy apparently didn't make it clear on the website what the consultancy did. And I find the idea of MPs selling themselves to someone, anything, whatever it is they want from me, I find inherently amusing. And again, it comes back to nothing illegal has been done, by the way. 
nothing inherently unparliamentary or improper. And the people making the documentary don't claim that. It's that it's so tawdry. It's just not something you want to see your representative doing. And by the way, what precisely is Quasi or Matt Hancock selling? They're not exactly regarded as the most successful public servants we've had in this country. No, now, Lord uh, Peter Lilly, earlier in the show, we debated whether shares in Keir Starmer are a little too high at the moment and shares in Rishi Sunak a little too low. What's your view? That was the topic of my big opinion. I think you can't rule out the Tories winning the next election. You can't rule it out. Obviously, you'd be unwise on the opinion polls to bet your house on that happening. Uh, Rishi is very able, extremely clever. He's got one weakness which is that he doesn't come over with fire in his belly. He needs to be able to uh, make people believe that he believes in things. He does believe in things, but Mrs. Thatcher said to, have com to carry conviction, you have to have convictions. But you also have to express those convictions, and that he doesn't do. What he can't do is outbore Starmer. Starmer's game plan is just to be boring. If he's boring, then uh, and people are fed up with the Tories, they'll vote for him. If we are equally boring, they'll still vote for him. So we've got to be interesting, competent, able, and driven. Uh, and uh, Rishi is two thirds of those things. He's got to be the third thing as well. He's got to show that he's driven by principles, ideas, a vision, which people can uh, identify with. Um, Tim Stanley, I can bring you the exclusive results of our Twitter poll on this topic. Will Rishi Sunak defy the odds and win the next general election? Let's take a look at the graphic. Um, at the moment, it would appear that 70.3% of the public say that he will not win the next election. Um, however, 297 7 <coughs> think he's in with a, with a shout. Uh, your colleague, uh, Fraser Nelson at The Telegraph, thinks there's a a slight chance they could surprise everyone next year. What's your view, Tim? I'm afraid I think safe money is still on Labour winning an election. There's another element to this, which is that tomorrow the new leader of the SNP will be announced. And right now in Scotland, Labour is edging up towards the SNP, could even overtake it. If that happens, then Scotland is then in play for Labour, and that just makes getting a majority even easier. And in terms of national polls, uh, Labour is still far, far ahead. I'm not going to deny that Rishi Sunak has surprised, but that's partly that he appears to have done well in the context of what came before. We've been through a year of political chaos. And someone delivering the Windsor uh, framework, someone going to meet Macron and having such an amiable meeting or apparently doing so much on the boats, it looks good partly compared to what the Tories did before. And I think a lot of people are still going to judge the Conservative Party as a whole on its 13 years in government, not just the performance of Rishi in the last few months. My thanks to Lord Lilly and Telegraph columnist Tim Stanley. A fascinating conversation. What's your view? Do you think that Rishi Sunak can turn the tables and surprise everyone with an election victory in a year's time? Mark at gbnews.uk. And what about those second jobs? How do you feel about your MP moonlighting for cold, hard cash? Mark at gbnews is the email. Now, coming up... As Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, gets fined almost £2,000 and gets six points on his licence for doubling the speed limit, for driving over 30 miles an hour uh, over the speed limit he was driving in, should politicians be held to a higher standard? Also, should landlords be limited to the number of properties they can own? And does Agatha Christie need a woke makeover? All of that's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. Like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. 
We're proud to be GV News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. Look, a big response to our conversation about the government. Uh, are the Tories on the verge of surprising everyone and winning the next election? Uh, this from, uh, let's have a look. Um, oh, yes, uh, Steve, who says, uh, Mark, I do think that Rishi Sunak is a talented guy and I think he will produce a result in a year's time. Um, on whether MPs should have second jobs and second careers. Hi, Mark, says Colin. 650 inexperienced people are called MPs and paid £84,000 to stick to the party line. Colin, thank you for that. Uh, now let's get to the pundits in which my fantastic, brilliant political commentators react to the big stories of the day. Tonight, top columnist and broadcaster Angela Epstein legendary news journalist Michael Crick and leadership coach, author and social commentator Adrian Hayes. Now, Greater Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham has been fined almost £2,000 after speeding at 78 miles an hour on a 40 mile an hour motorway. This is uh, not the first time a politician has broken the law, but should politicians be held to higher standards? Michael. Yes, they should, actually. Uh, the, the politicians are the people who pass the laws, who make the laws, and uh, if they uh, break them, I think it undermines uh, the rule of law much more than if an ordinary person does. Mind you, it was a stiff fine in this case, wasn't it? Nearly yeah. £2,000. Um, and uh, I think he was, he was driving in one of those areas that the speed limit had been reduced and uh, he claimed not to have noticed it. And I think he's probably... I, don't know, I, I think I believe him on that. But I think, as a principle, yeah, I think politicians uh, should... Uh, and equally, I think that would apply to the ex-Prime Minister when it comes to uh, parties in Dan Downing Street. Well, well absolutely. But, but, Adrian, I mean, you are an award-winning adventurer, a record-breaking adventurer. 78 miles an hour on a 40 road. That's going some. Look, don't ask me about smart motorways. Is there anything but smart? I detest them. Uh, and let's be honest, who of us hasn't gone through when it... Who's that, who hasn't noticed the reduced speed limit? So I, I would defend Burnham for speeding on a motorway. Simply, we all drive above 70 on motorways. Every car is going around 80. But on the wider principle, I agree with Michael. I think we do have to hold politicians more accountable. And, and I, I said this on the show before, you know, what I want above all from politicians, honesty, integrity and authenticity. Have we got that today? Uh, suspect. Not. Uh, Angela, you, you live in Manchester yeah, and he and is your mayor. 
He is my mayor, and uh, I know that stretch of motorway very well, junction 10 and 9 and 10 on the M62. Mm. Um, and it is a smart motorway, and Adrian's right, they are awful things. They have these basically variable speed limits that, that chop and change according to the traffic flow in order to manage uh, traffic expectations and keep cars moving. So, um, yeah, OK, it sounds like fair mitigation, but he held up his hands and said, I'm, I'm guilty. He was still doing 78, so even if it had been a 70, he was going over 70. Um, but what what sort of concerned me about the story about, yes, agreeing with that, they, they, you know, they need to lead by example, is this is his turf. Smart motorways are very much in the news. There's a lot of controversy about whether they have any benefit and whether they're actually dangerous. And you would hope a switched on politician yes. who knows his own geography would be aware of, of uh, a smart motorway stretch. You can see them because the damn things don't have um, hard shoulders. They just have these sporadic yeah. um, laybys. They're dangerous things. And there's so much sort of conversation about them, for him not to be aware of that and say, oh, my mind was elsewhere, then soz, Andy. I mean, I don't buy that. There you go. Well, uh, a young millionaire couple have purchased an entire village based in Wales. The new landowners have bumped up rent by an extortionate 60 per cent. Many locals have been left in fear of eviction, desperate to keep their homes. So it begs the question, should landlords be limited to the number of properties they own? What do you think, Angela? Absolutely not. First of all, we've got a big problem with those who have the good fortune to accrue any kind of cash in, in today's kind of um, economic situation is that it... I'm, I am the wife of an accountant, so this is the very thrilling pillow talk that goes on in our house. Um, but, um, but, you know, the view is that you have cash in the bank, you don't really enjoy the largesse of, of interest rates that are beneficial to the savers, so it just withers. So what do you do if you've worked hard all your life you've built up some reserves then you put it into property so that those are free market values also they're not removing properties from the rental market they're just more people are owning them uh, we do need more affordable housing more affordable social housing unequivocally yes but I think you know somebody is selling them as well so it's not just about the the people who are uh, putting you know amalgamating a big portfolio somebody is willing to sell the stuff well this couple have bought an entire village don't you think it reflects the unequal nature of our society well, now. I mean, an entire village, that's not a nest egg, is it? That's not a pied à terre. But that, they are entitled to do with their wealth what they want to do if somebody is selling that. Now, but the if they breaks, can then crank up rents by 60%, that's unethical, surely. That's what landlords do. That's the whole buy-to-let market. should they be allowed no, to do but, it? No, but hang on. Who, who allowed them? There's no monopoly and mergers thing about Welsh villages. Why were they allowed to buy so many properties? Why blame the, the, the person who's buying it? Blame, blame the vendor. What do you think, Michael? Some more controls? Uh, no, I think rent controls and controls on the number of properties that people can own would have adverse effects in the long term and would deter people from renting out properties and buying private... And, and it would cause even more problems for the rental market. I just think morally it's wrong. And, you know, we should all be saying this. You know, to put up somebody's rent, uh, ordinary people's rents, by 60% uh, is disgusting. And that is... Uh, and that should be made clear to this couple. OK, well, in the latest saga of literary revisionism, a number of Agatha Christie novels have been amended to remove supposedly racist terms and outdated language. This comes just weeks after a household name uh, uh, author, Roald Dahl, um, his books and, of course, Ian Fleming's books were edited to within in, an inch of their lives. So do Agatha Christie books need a wake mo uh, woke makeover? I'll put my teeth back in in a minute. Um, what, what do you think about this, Adrian? Yeah, look, this is just one tip of the iceberg of everything on the whole culture wars, which I spoke about earlier. Look, we're in a society where we are bringing up people in this sanitised, cotton wool, wrapped up society, which will work if, work if the world goes in that for the, rest of the, for the rest of our lifetimes, but it isn't like that. And I think, think what we are harming our younger people in particular by just, by over-sensitivities, by taking offence, by just being so concerned about what's written in books, we're doing more harm than good. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about this? Have you read Agatha things. Christie's novels? I haven't read Agatha... I, don't, I might have read one, but I'm not an Agatha Christie uh, fan. I mean, my view of it is, look, it, it's really up to the copyright holders, who are presumably the Christie family and the Dahl family. If they want to produce another edition, a woke edition, uh, then fine. What I hope they won't do is stop producing the original editions. Mm. And I think that's what's now been agreed in the case of Dahl. It's not, not clear here what's going to happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if, if we have two different editions, woke and non-woke, and that puts up sales, then great. 
Angela, I think it's wrong to touch any art, particularly if the author, the creator, is no longer with us. Yeah, I think so. I think it's messing with the family silver. Very recently, I was, um, I was writing a travel piece about a place called Wallingford in South Oxfordshire, which is where Agatha Christie, at the height of her fame, bought a home so that she could enjoy a kind of secluded existence and write her books. The local museum has lots of stuff about her. She's a million miles away from this kind of monstrous... If you, if you reflect the, the, the text to the person that writes it, you know, she, the suggestion is she's some, some kind of monstrous, racist, sexist, misogynist, all these horrible words we hear all the time. Well, she was just a very nice lady who wrote books and used the parlance of the time. I mean, it okay. says things like, you know, you Jew, I mean, you know, I'm Jewish, I don't think cancel the whole lot. It, it reflects the time in which, she, in which she wrote. There you go. Well, who done it? Some woke publishers. Uh, we'll discuss that via email, mark at gbnews.uk. But next up, saint or sinner? We'll discuss Winston Churchill next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's time now for Mark Meets. And this is the moment when I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, sports, showbiz and beyond, as well as those who have a big story to tell. And it doesn't get much bigger than Winston Churchill, whose controversial stint as a Scottish MP long before the war is chronicled by the highly respected historian Andrew Liddell in his brand new book, Cheers, Mr. Churchill, Winston in Scotland, the book's winning rave reviews with the top Churchill biographer, Andrew Roberts, calling it groundbreaking. Andrew Liddell, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Hi, Mark. Thanks very much for having me on. 
And thank you for dressing up as well. Churchill would be proud. Um, how did Winston Churchill end up as an MP in Scotland for nearly 15 years? Well, it's quite an interesting story, actually. Um, he, he was elected in 1908 um, uh, in a by-election in Dundee. Um, but the reason he had to fight that was because he was actually defeated in another by-election in, in Manchester Northwest. Uh, mm -hmm. Because before 1926, when you moved into the cabinet for the first time, uh, you had to fight a by-election in your constituency, uh, something called the ministerial by-election rule, which, you know, some people might argue we should possibly bring back. Um, so um, uh, Churchill had to fight a by-election in Manchester Northwest, which he lost, um, and he then urgently needed a seat in order to take his position in the cabinet for the first time. Um, so a really important kind of um, pinch point in Churchill's career. Uh, and there was an availability in Dundee. Um, and so he was he went up there, came up to Scotland, um, fought the seat and um, would hold it for almost the next 15 years. Was his contribution to Scotland a positive one? Very much so, I think. I mean, I think it's a shame, uh, you know, in Scotland today that perhaps... Uh, Churchill's time as MP for Dundee uh, and his contribution to Scottish politics isn't recognised as much as it should be. Mm. Um, but he did play a really important role um, in Scottish politics during his time as MP and, and afterwards. In particular, he was a huge enthusiast, um, for better or worse, for, for devolution, uh, one of the earliest kind of pioneers and advocates for for a Scottish Parliament. Uh, in 1911, he took a plan to um, the Cabinet, uh, which would have delivered a, a devolution settlement actually on a greater scale than, than the one that was eventually delivered in 1999. Um, so, you know, a huge pioneer, I guess, of, of Scottish sort of um, political aspirations, obviously stopping um, well short of, um, of independence. But he, he did make a very valuable contribution, I think, to, to Scottish political life. Was there any evidence as a Scottish MP of the star he would become? Absolutely. I mean, this period, you know, where he was MP from, as I said, from 1908 to 1922, uh, you know, it was really the, the emergence of Churchill as a kind of national political figure. Um, it was his big breaks in, in cabinet. Uh, you know, he was first Lord of the Admiralty. Um, he had a bit of a difficulty, obviously, with, with the Dardanelles and Gallipoli. Um, but he was a huge national political figure and he really cut his teeth in Dundee, uh, doing lots of public speaking. Uh, huge kind of um, events with, you know, thousands and thousands of people uh, uh, turning up. Um, so there was definitely a taste of, of, um, of things that to come. And I think that, you know, this period he showed his resilience, I suppose, in a way that, um, you know, we would all benefit from uh, in, in 1940. Was he as witty and insightful and as eloquent uh, as he would become as our prime minister? Um, he certainly was, actually. I mean, he faced a tough time, um, particularly in his final election in Dundee. Uh, there was one uh, rally that he held that was disrupted by kind of communists. And someone shouted out, um, you know, you're going to be bottom of the poll, uh, to which he responded, well, at least allow me one dying kick. Um, you know, and there was so he was he was he managed to keep up quite good. Um, good form, uh, e even when he was facing a bit of a, a difficult time. Um, and, you know, he very much had all the kind of accoutrement and, um, uh, and habits that we would think of as being Churchillian today. You know, he would have big kind of champagne suppers in Dundee. I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is looking at his hotel receipts, uh, you know, which show that he spent as much on kind of uh, champagne, cigars, hot baths, uh, these kind of luxuries during his visits to the constituency as he did on the actual hotel rooms himself. Um, so he certainly had a good time, I think, as well when he was, uh, when he was up there. What's your view of this revisionist approach to the legacy of Winston Churchill? In your view, was he a saint or a sinner? Well, I think it was very interesting, Mark. You were talking a little bit earlier just about, about literary revisionism. I think there's definitely, mm. uh, in Scotland and indeed, I think in a wider sense, uh, a re bit of a revisionist attitude towards um, Churchill at the moment, you know, which I think is, is largely uh, misplaced. Um, I think particularly in the Scottish context, you know, it's heavily influenced, negative perceptions of Churchill are heavily influenced uh, by the nationalist movement that we have in Scotland um, and by a desire, um, I think, to denigrate Churchill as a figure of Britishness. Uh, you know, I think he therefore has become a sort of rather sad casualty, I think, in, in, in the war between uh, kind of pro and anti-independence uh, forces. Um, so, so I would definitely, you know, I think... 
even putting aside what 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 um, what Churchill did in Scotland, I think you know his role in saving the country and indeed uh, you know kind of civilization in in 1940 definitely means he's he's a saint in my eyes. Briefly, if you can, Andrew, um, you are up in. Scotland's capital right now, as we speak, Old Reiki, the beautiful city of Edinburgh. Who do you think is going to become the next first minister? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, if I was a betting man, I'd say possibly Kate Forbes uh, uh, mm. might sneak it. Um, of course, um, Hamza Youssef, one of the other candidates, does have something in common with Churchill in, in, in both being a uh, resident in Dundee, uh, although <laughs> Hamza doesn't actually represent Dundee. But anyway, that's a slightly different story. Uh, but no, I, th I think Kate uh, stands a good, very good chance. And, uh, you know, I think yeah. she, on balance, be the best for the country. Uh, congratulations on the publication of the book. It's had glowing reviews. As I mentioned, the iconic Churchill biographer Andrew Roberts has called it groundbreaking. Uh, the book is called Cheers, Mr. Churchill, Winston in Scotland, and its author is Andrew Liddell. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. By some distance, my best dressed guest on tonight's show, wearing a Churchillian cigar. He was only missing the cigar itself. Um, I should say bow tie have gone mad. Listen, folks, uh, lots more to get through. A busy hour to come. We're hearing that Prince Andrew wants to write a tell all book. I'll be reacting to that in my take at 10. And let me tell you, I'm not pulling my punches. Plus, we've got tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30 with my fantastic pundits. Lots to get through. Prince Andrew's next. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit. Well, off. you oh, are. Well, you, that's my you, ringtone. You, you, no. My political ambitions are <laughs> those days are gone. I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. To have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel.
It's 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, Prince Andrew, we're told, is considering writing a tell-all book. Have the British public not suffered enough? I'll be reacting to that one and I won't be pulling my royal punches. Will the government's crackdown on antisocial behaviour work? My newsmaker tonight is former prisons minister Anne Widdicombe. We've got the papers at 10.30 sharp with full panel reactions. So big guests, big stories and always big opinions. A lively hour to come. Lots to get through. Prince Andrew next. But first up, GB News royalty, Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. It's uh, 10 o'clock. Here's the latest. A major incident has been declared in Dorset after the equivalent of 200 barrels of oil and saline solution spilt into Poole Harbour this morning. Harbour commissioners say the leak came from a pipeline leading into the Witch Farm onshore processing facility. The pipeline has been shut down and the oil has been contained. Members of the public are being advised not to swim in Poole Harbour or the surrounding area. Offenders who commit antisocial behaviour will be forced to clean up their communities as part of the Prime Minister's new immediate justice scheme. Under the plans to be announced tomorrow, local authorities will be given new powers to quickly and visibly punish criminals. Those who spray graffiti or commit other vandalism will have to fix the damage within 48 hours. Other penalties include picking up litter and washing police cars. Well, as part of that crackdown, the government has also announced a ban on the sale of laughing gas. Levelling up Secretary Michael Gove told broadcasters that nitrous oxide canisters are helping to fuel antisocial behaviour and turning public spaces into drug-taking arenas. England has beaten Ukraine 2-0 in their Group C Euro qualifier match. Both teams joined for a photograph before the game as players clutched a Ukrainian flag with peace written across it. The FA had given 1,000 free tickets to Ukrainian refugees and their British hosts to attend the game. First half goals from Harry Kane and Bukayo Saka were enough to seal the win. The teams will face off again in September. Tensions have heightened between Russia and Ukraine, with the country's state media saying that a blast in the Tula region was caused by a Ukrainian drone packed with explosives. Three people were reportedly injured when they were struck by shrapnel. However, Ukraine has not claimed responsibility for the attack. It follows pleas from the European Union for Russia to halt the stationing of nuclear weapons in Belarus. Kyiv's foreign ministry has called the decision provocative. They're calling for a session of the UN Security Council. The US president has declared a state of emergency in Mississippi after a tornado killed at least 26 people. The twister swept through the state and on into Alabama, cutting a path of destruction 170 miles long. Around 11,000 residents there are still without power. They say there was no safe place to hide. We're on TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn 2. This is GB News. Back now to Mark. Thanks, Ray. This is Mark Dolan tonight. Will the government's crackdown on antisocial behaviour work? My newsmaker tonight is former prisons minister, best-selling author and TV personality Anne Widdicombe. We've got the papers at exactly 10.30 sharp, with full reaction from three of the country's top pundits. And coming up, my take at 10. And it's all about Prince Andrew. Lots to get through. Big stories, big guests and always big opinions. Let's start with this. A pandemic, a war in Ukraine, a cost of living crisis, three prime ministers in a year. Have we not suffered enough? It seems not. We're hearing that the right royal numpty Prince Andrew wants to write a book. That's assuming he gets hold of enough crayons to write it with. Now, hot on the heels of Prince Harry's 400-page monathon, in which the world's least happy millionaire rants about how terrible his life is from the luxury of his Californian mansion, it seems that his highly libidinous uncle, the man previously known as Randy Andy, wants to tell his story. Why bother? We know it already. 
This is a prince who's brought the royal family into disrepute with his friendship with known paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. And he made a fool of himself and his family with that Newsnight interview in which he claimed to have a disorder in which he doesn't sweat. Well, he's sweating now as he faces a possible eviction from his £30 million home, the Royal Lodge in Windsor, after our dynamic new king, Charles, threatens to cut his annual salary of a quarter of a million pounds. But this fat cat aristocrat won't go hungry. It turns out the privileged prince has inherited millions from his late mother and father. Nice work if you can get it. Our modernising new king, Charles III, who I think we can all agree has got off to a cracking start, wants to have a slimmed down monarchy. And the first lump of unwanted fat that he's dealing with is Andrew himself, who hasn't just discredited members of his own family, he is a national embarrassment. Prince Andrew is a man who was gifted an incredible house by his late mother when he got married, but sold it to a Kazakh oligarch for £15 million in 2005. And this is a man who settled out of court to the tune of millions against his accuser, Virginia Giuffre, who said she was forced to have relations with him when she was just 17 years old. Now, to be fair, Andrew has strongly protested his innocence on that. No problem. He may have been stitched up. My good pal, socialite Lady Victoria Hervey, thinks just that. And she told me as much on this very show last month. Who knows? Either way, his behaviour has been below par for a top royal. And he hasn't shown an ounce of contrition for the embarrassment he's brought to his family and to his country. And why is he thinking of writing a book? It can't be money. This is a man who never has to work again. Not that he did in the first place. If he does go ahead with this autobiography and heaps more shame on the family, King Charles should throw the book at him. There's only one positive. If old Randy Andy does put pen to paper and releases a book, you'll never have to worry about toilet roll shortages. Because like the prince himself, this worthless tome will be going right down the royal plug hole. That said, it might shift a few copies in the children's section of your local Waterstones. So rumours abound that Prince Andrew is to write a tell-all autobiography. Your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Let's get the view of top royal biographer, best-selling author and historian Tom Bauer. Hi, Tom. Hi, uh, good evening. First of all, if he does write this book, will it sell? Well, it depends what he says. If he does the same as Harry and pours scorn on his family and on the, the king... Uh, it will sell because there'll be enormous interest in his in his sludge. I mean, in the end, it depends how deep he wants to go into his own past. Uh, if it's just a book about saying I'm innocent, clearly not. Mm. But um, I think that he has looked across at Harry, who has sold, what, three, four million books and made a huge amount of money, and encouraged by his ex-wife, Fergie, thinks I should do the same. The trouble with the trouble with Andrew is he's a fantasist, and not only that, he's insensitive to his plight. He really does believe that he's innocent. He can't believe that uh, what people think about him. He's so arrogant that uh, he's immune to it all, and he feels also he's got a grievance, and the grievance is that uh, when he bought the house, uh, he sold the house and moved into the lodge. He used the money from the sale of the house to the Kazakhs to refurbish the lodge in Windsor Park. Mm. He also was given a 78-year lease, and he doesn't see why he should be forced out of the house when he's legally the owner, that, uh, or the occupant, anyway. And that's the problem. He's a man on a mission to get his revenge against his brother. Now, of course, Andrew has had a longer life than... Prince Harry and has seen more goings on within royal circles. So potentially a Prince Andrew book could be infinitely more damaging than Harry's. Well, I think so. And it'll be another perspective. I mean, this is all now becoming blackmail. 
is mm. not just um, a book. It's a book with a purpose. And I think that he looks at his brother, the king, and sees that uh, Charles hasn't dealt firmly in suppressing Harry and Meghan. And he thinks if Harry and Meghan can get away with it, then so can I. What do we know of Andrew and Charles's relationship hitherto? It's pretty bad. I mean, there's very little to like about Andrew. Uh, while Charles worked very hard and had lots of intellectual and other interests and had an agenda for change and all sorts of improvements and sometimes controversy, Andrew just spent his whole, has spent his whole life after leaving the uh, Army Air Force enjoying himself and being very rude to people and being very vulgar and being uh, 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 actually quite obnoxious. Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, he always thinks that he deserves better and more, but never works to prove why he should be given more. And of course, when he was a trade representative of Britain traveling around the world, what came out in a, a whole lot of leaked uh, memoranda and messages and emails was how unbelievably vulgar and rude he was everywhere. And he hasn't done himself any good um, with his relationship with Fergie, and his daughters have done very little, uh, and he wasted a vast amount of money buying a house in the Swiss Alps, which he was then forced to sell. I mean, he's unfortunately a bit of a catastrophe. Was he spoiled by the late Queen? Is he a monster of his mother's making? <laughs> Well, he's undoubtedly of his mother's making. I think monster is probably a bit too harsh. He is a casualty. He is a person who really needed a good education and some strict upbringing and some guidance of, to get a proper job. He is a perfect example of why, in the modern age, uh, royals should get a proper job and a proper uh, line of uh, responsibility, just like his sister, Princess Anne. Uh, who is an exemplary example of a hard-working royal, as is Charles, and as is Edward. The problem with Andrew is that he's never really done anything. He can't do anything. He just indulges himself, uh, and, and has, it brings just discredit on the royal family, and is determined to push himself back into the public view. I mean, having been told to retire from public view because he brought such shame on the royal family, he's aptly determined to ignore those orders, uh, and he's encouraged in that by his wife, ex-wife, unfortunately. Are, are we being a little harsh on him, though, Tom? After all, he served in the Falklands. Uh, many would argue, including his friend, the socialite Lady Victoria Hervey, that he's been stitched up by Virginia Dufre. Perhaps we're giving this guy a bad rap. Well, Mark, after your introduction, I didn't see any uh, any temper, temporalism in your introduction. I mean, I think you got it perfectly right. No. I mean, the, the Falklands was 30 years ago, and his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein was absolutely outrageous. I mean, and his interview with uh, on Newsnight just showed how he didn't understand the horror of his conduct. To go back to Epstein's house after Epstein had been convicted and served a sentence for paedophilia, wasn't just bad judgment. It was self-indulgent beyond belief. It was that he really is a ligger. He just wants to live off other people and clearly liked the idea of Epstein introducing him to yet more girls. I mean, he is a disgraceful person. And instead of retiring and disappearing, as he has been asked to do by Charles, he's now clearly doing the exact opposite. And that is Charles's problem. On the one hand, he's got Harry, who is causing endless problems. And on the other, he's got uh, Prince Andrew. Uh, as I would say, I mean, it's the madhouse, it looks, in the House of Windsor at the moment. And Charles needs to take a grip, a very firm grip. Uh, and he's failing to do that at the moment, because that's the only way in which Andrew will be pushed back into his box. Tom, a delight to have you on the programme. Tom Bauer, of course, best-selling author. His latest book is all about Meghan Markle. It's a bestseller. Go buy it and find out why. Thanks, Tom. Your reaction. Is there any way back to public life for Prince Andrew? If he writes an autobiography, will you buy it? Will you read it? Well, I believe, Maria, we've got the results in. Uh, we put out a text poll before the programme to ask whether you would be interested 
in a book by Prince Andrew about his life. Will you buy it, was the question. Oh dear, bad news. 93.8% uh, say no, and 6.2% say they might give it a go. There's always hope. Uh, thank you, folks. Lots more to come. Will the government's crackdown on antisocial behaviour work? We'll be asking former Home Office Minister Anne Widdicombe. She's tonight's newsmaker, and she's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. It's time now for The Newsmaker, in which we tackle a big story of the day in the company of a fearless commentator. Tonight, people who vandalise public spaces will have to repair the damage they cause within 48 hours of being given an order under new government plans. Communities will also have a say on how offenders are punished. The pilot scheme covering 10 areas aims to show the public such acts are quickly and visibly punished. The pilot forms part of a crackdown on antisocial behaviour, which the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will announce tomorrow, as he says he hopes to end the scourge of antisocial behaviour once and for all. But will it work? Who better to ask than former prisons minister, best selling author, and television personality Anne Widdicombe? Hi, Anne. Anne Widdicombe. Hi, Anne. Hello. And what's your reaction to these latest measures to tackle antisocial behaviour uh, with very visible punishments? Well, they sound good, but we've had this. We've had this before. We've had people having to wear uh, tabards saying "community payback" and all this sort of thing. We've had it before. What really matters is that people who do uh, indulge in antisocial behaviour, and particularly those who are doing it 
repeatedly and causing a misery for neighbours, that they are actually dealt with quickly. I mean, the key to what Rishi is saying here is uh, in the word quickly. I'll believe it when it happens. I think it's a good mm. idea. It isn't anything that we haven't had before. And frankly, everything depends on the sheer willpower of the local police. And given that you are a former Home Office minister, can you explain to my viewers and listeners why tackling this so-called low-level crime is so important? Oh, it's important because it really does make people's lives a misery. Um, I have seen some of those very big inner-city council estates uh, where people are just subject to vandalism uh, and uh, to uh, graffiti. They wake up in the morning, somebody's wrecked their garden. Uh, they come back at night, there's graffiti uh, all around. Uh, and sometimes it's just loud behaviour, which is threatening, if you're, particularly if you're elderly or if you're on your own. Uh, and it makes people's lives a misery. That is why it is important to tackle it. And quite honestly, the police have never really put this very high up their agenda. What about tougher sentences? I wouldn't mind seeing tougher sentences, but what I'd really like to see is householders' rights being respected. I mean, if somebody goes out and challenges these thugs, um, you know, and, and if then fisticuffs result, it's the mm. householder who then gets prosecuted because it's an easy arrest, isn't it? It's an easy box to tick. Uh, now, I would like to see householders given much more protection and the presumption much more with them that if there is a nuisance and there's no police about, they can go out and deal with it. Now, I'm not suggesting they go out and get into fights, but that they can go out and they can challenge uh, and that, that those people should then be dealt with instead of the householder being dealt with. Now, Anne Widdicombe, uh, on Monday, at the beginning of the week, you attended a press conference in which you announced your support for uh, Reform UK at the next general election. Why? Because uh, I've given up wholly now with the Conservatives, largely as a result, in fact, recently entirely as a result uh, of the uh, betrayal of Northern Ireland. I mean, what we had was a terrible deal negotiated by Theresa May. Boris then came along with big promises about getting Brexit done. He tinkered with that deal and drew a border down the Irish Sea. We've now got Rishi tinkering with the tinkering and again pronouncing it as a great victory when the easy fact to check is that the EU will still have power uh, in Northern Ireland and Stormont, despite all the talk of the Stormont break, won't be able to do a darn thing about it because that break is hedged about with too many qualifications. And even if it were successful, the EU would then be entitled to claim compensation for us. When are we going to get the understanding that leaving the EU means that the whole UK leaves the EU? We don't give it jurisdiction in one part of ourselves. Could your support for Reform UK backfire? As a lifelong Conservative, are you not concerned that Reform UK could hand the keys of number 10 to Keir Starmer? Well, uh, obviously, I don't want to see Keir Starmer in number 10, but quite honestly, the Conservatives have almost certainly lost the next election anyway. Uh, and it's no good doing this. We did this before. The Brexit party stood down against all the Conservative candidates uh, in order to get Brexit done. Brexit hasn't been done. We've been betrayed once. We're not falling for that a second time. But if you had to choose, would you take uh, Sunak over Starmer? Labour, but quite honestly, there's not much difference now. We've got a deeply red party in this country and we've got a pale pink party in this country. And there is no truly Conservative party, apart from reform, now operating in this country. And what can be achieved by Reform UK in the absence of proportional representation? Oh, I think, I mean, I think two things. First of all, I think the mere fact that we're here and that we're going to stand in every single seat in the next election. I mean, I think that itself fires an enormous warning shot across the Tory bows. Now, they know that we want certain things. We want Northern Ireland fully reintegrated uh, into the United Kingdom. We want Brexit done. We want lower taxes. They know what we want, and they know that we will stand against them unless they do it. Um, and therefore, I mean, I think there is that pressure. But also this, no, we haven't got proportional representation and I don't want us to have proportional representation. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the one advantage of Keir Starmer is this, he doesn't frighten people. Corbyn frightened people.
People were saying to me in the last election on the doorstep, and we'd love to vote for you, but we're afraid of letting Corbyn in. Mm. They're not afraid of letting Starmer in, and so it is not inconceivable that they will give their votes to third parties because they're so fed up with both the major ones, uh, and that we will, I'm not suggesting we can form a government, but that we will get seats and that we will have power in Westminster. However, a Labour government would be far more Europhile than any Conservative government under Rishi Sunak. Don't forget, the leader of the opposition campaigned to reverse Brexit. And you can live with him in number 10? I can't live with either of them in number 10. Don't tell me the Conservatives are more uh, pro-Brexit than, than the Labour Party. The Conservatives have shown exactly what they believe in, which is they still believe in the EU. I mean, why is Rishi Sunak pouring money into the coffers of Macron when he hasn't delivered anything uh, in terms of stopping the boats uh, in return for previous lots of money? Why is he actually giving the EU power in Northern Ireland? That is not Brexit. That really isn't Brexit. So don't talk to me about, oh, the Conservatives are far more in favour of Brexit than Labour. Neither of them have a clue when it comes to Brexit. We were slightly concerned about sound issues before the interview, but Anne Widdicombe is in full voice. Anne, I look forward to catching up in a week's time. Former Conservative government minister, Home Office minister and best-selling author and television personality, and now the jewel in the crown of Reform UK. Do you agree with Anne that uh, reform could make a difference at the next election? A truly properly conservative option? Let me know, Mark, at gbnews.uk. We've got the papers next with full pundit reaction. Don't go anywhere. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's exactly 10.30. It's time for tomorrow's papers. Maria, where shall we start? OK, let's go to the Express first of all. Actually, let's have a stink. Come on. And there is the Daily Express. Tory rebels fight to close migrant loophole. Tory rebels have urged Rishi Sunak to close every legal loophole that allows foreign judges to interfere with Britain's borders. Ministers rushed to quell a backbench revolt ahead of the illegal migration bills passing through Parliament. Yes, he came. Harry scores again as England beat Ukraine. Next up, The Telegraph PM targets beggars in crackdown on crime. Rishi Sunak is to launch a crackdown on begging as he announces a war on antisocial behaviour, a topic I raised with Anne Widdicombe just a moment ago. The PM will unveil a series of new powers allowing police to move on rough sleepers, uh, move on rough sleepers who are causing public distress. This could include people who are blocking shop doorways, asking for money at cash machines or leaving their belongings on pavements. Sturgeon's exit boosts Labour's chances, say The Telegraph. Nicola Sturgeon's departure from office will help Keir Starmer become Prime Minister, according to the Scottish Labour leader. Anas Sawa told The Telegraph's Choppers Politics podcast that when she stands down as First Minister tomorrow, it will make, in some ways, uh, life easier for Labour to achieve a government. Safe routes to be opened for 20,000 migrants a year is the other story in The Telegraph. The Guardian and NHS chiefs sound alarm on spiralling staff shortages. Laughing gas banned in Sunak, Asbo crackdown and Mississippi devastated by a ferocious tornado. The I newspaper, Sunak moves to calm Tory nerves ahead of crunch vote on small boats. The government faces a rebellion of up to 60 Tory MPs who want to toughen up its flagship illegal migration bill as it hits the Commons. The independent Ukrainian fans make their voices heard. Rishi, we need F-16s. A message for the Prime Minister yesterday at uh, England's 2-0 Wembley Euro qualifier win over Ukraine. Also revealed Britain's organ donor crisis. A woman receiving end-of-life care says she's just waiting to die as an agonising three-year wait for a kidney transplant has left her living like a prisoner. Uh, this woman is among some 7,000 patients on the waiting list, the highest figure for a decade. Uh, the Metro now, hippie crackdown. We're back to the Asbos folks. Laughing gas, known as hippie crack, will be banned from sale to the public in a clampdown on yes. You guessed it, antisocial behaviour. Michael Gove said the increasing scourge in which young people inhale nitrous oxide from metal canisters through a balloon was turning parks into drug-taking arenas that leave others feeling unsafe. The Times, over 800 sewage spills a day. Uh, this is all part of the Times' Clean It Up water campaign. Raw sewage was dumped into rivers and coastal areas across England more than 300,000 times last year, despite a fall in the overall number of spills. Braverman is a puppet for Tory rebels. Suella Braverman is accused of secretly backing a backbench rebellion against her own illegal migration bill to push Downing Street into toughening measures to tackle the small boats crisis, which could involve tearing up the European Convention on Human Rights. Pointless tests are delaying cancer care, NHS is warned. And last but not least for now, the Daily Star. Uh, the weather forecast. Oh, poor blimey. It's going to rain cats and dogs. A 150 mile an hour jet stream will bring torrential storms. Those weather boffins are giving it some welly. A deluge of rain is heading our way. Things can only get wetter. And that is The Daily Star. Giving us some much needed levity, let's be honest. Uh, let's get reaction now to the big stories of the day. Tomorrow's front pages with columnist and broadcaster Angela Epstein, legendary news journalist Michael Crick, and leadership coach, author and social commentator Adrian Hayes. 
Uh, let's have a look at this story in the Express, Michael, if we can. Tory rebels fight to close migrant loophole. How does this one play out? Well, this is all about um, uh, basically allowing or encouraging uh, the British government to um, ignore rulings of the European Court uh, of Human Rights. Which is uh, a political court and some would argue advisory. Well, you, would, you might argue it's a political court. I'm not sure I would. And, um, uh, well, I mean, it depends what Plenty you... Plenty of e EU, EU member states ignore its uh, well, verdicts all and the indeed, time, and don't indeed, they? And, indeed, and indeed, British governments have ignored its rulings in the past. Mm. Um, and, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that was a wise thing to do, but it seems to me that you don't need... You, you, well, I'm not a lawyer and I don't understand... Uh, I'm not into that area of law, but given that this, our government and other governments have ignored their rulings in the past, I'm not sure it needs... Uh, an amendment to the immigration, uh, the illegal immigration bill, uh, in order to do that. Maybe uh, someone uh, would be able to explain that to me. Uh, and in any case, um, uh, how are they going to get this amendment through when yeah. Labour would vote against it anyway? So how are they going to get an amendment like that through the House of Commons? Uh, well, that's right. The government's former top lawyer, Robert Buckland, told me on this show yeah. that tearing up the ECHR is a complete red herring. Yeah, yeah. And, um, the, uh, well, it br brings in so many wider issues. Mm. And after all, you know, we, we went into that process uh, after the war uh, in response to totalitarianism of the 1920s and 30s. And many of the principles uh, behind that um, are, are still highly important But then today. there are lawyers who think it's, it's past its sell-by date, that it needs revisions, that it's, it's an arcane mechanism. And this is all about fulfilling the will of the people, which is uh, the express wish of this government to stop the boats. That was in their manifesto in 2019, <coughs> that they would control illegal immigration. So they've got a, a, a political mandate with which to do it. Now they've just got to get past the lawyers. Well, I'm not sure that whatever the government does, be it a Labour government or a Conservative government, is really going to stop the boats. Um, or if it did stop the boats, then the people traffickers and the migrants would find another route into this country. After all, it's only a recent thing, the boats, isn't it? Four or five years. Before that, they used to come in in lorries. Yeah, and the, uh, and the, scan, the scanners came in. Uh, or, or, they, yeah. or they'll find different ways of getting here, you know, across different sea lanes or whatever. So I, I think... Um, that is a bit of a, you know, the whole thing but, about the, the, mm. the, the law um, is, uh, you, you might, you, you know, if you were to go along with this, yeah. I'm, I still don't think you're going to stop the migrants you, coming you here. Quite, I, I just think you sound quite defeatist about it. And I am, actually, yes. You sound yes, quite I don't... blasé, but, but my viewers and listeners, many of my viewers and yes. listeners are not blasé. And it was interesting uh, looking at uh, some recent polling published by Matt Goodwin, who I'm sure you know, Professor of yeah. Politics at the University of Kent. Yeah. Uh, and the vast majority of uh, the public support the idea of stopping illegal immigration into this country. And it could be decisive at the I, I recognise that, yeah, I recognise that. There we go, let's have a look. If you don't think stopping the boats is important, you're, uh, you're in the 16% who don't, according to Goodwin's latest research. Well, I, I do think it is important, but I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not sure anybody's come up with the solution. Mm. Um, I do think it's also important to allow genuine asylum seekers into this country. The trouble with the cross-channel traffic at the moment is it's people jumping to the front of the queue and, L and, and getting into this country ahead of much more deserving cases. These Tory In rebels, they just want to stop the boats and most of the British people, Angela Epstein, agree with them. Yes, I do. I mean, I think part yes. of the problem is that it, it's not a terribly fashionable or right-on thing to say, to, to sort of say, I don't want these people coming here because our natural humanity screams that something has to be done. But equally, you've got these heinous people traffickers taking people's, taking people's money, bringing them across these icy cold waters. We've had drownings. We've also had people who don't don't deserve the refugee status coming from places like Albania, young men who are clearly not fleeing persecution or, or fear of violence. And, and I think Germany won't accept Albanians. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Neither will Denmark. Absolutely. And you also have to look at the ramifications for the local communities who, who have to support the, their infrastructures, have to support the influx of refugees. You know, lots of us have uh, who have immigrant backgrounds. You know, it's not that we don't recognise the very important role that immigrants have played in this country. My grandfather came here at the turn of the century escaping persecution, but we have to find a new model. So it's all very well to say, deal with the laws. But as Michael says, what happens when they get here? We need uh, to find a way to do it. Is this all theatre from the Tories, as Michael might suggest? <sighs> The, the tide is turning, I, I think, because, as you said, Mark, you know, public opinion is firmly behind stopping these boats. And Michael asked, you know, how you've got to stop it some way. Well, you stop the business case. These 
Migrants, illegal migrants are paying 5,000 to 7,000 pounds sterling to come on these boats. You stop that happening and that the business case will, will, will soon collapse. So we've got to do something. And, I, you know, I've always said, because this comes back to the Brexit argument, I've said right from the start there were benefits mm. of staying in the EU, there was benefits in leaving, but there was no benefits in leaving without fully leveraging all the benefits. And whilst we're tied with the EHC, uh, EHCR, I can't see how we can sort of avoid these sort of uh, these battles. Michael Crick, laughing gas to be banned. Will you miss it? <laughs> um, you would if you're I've having a really baby. Noticed it. I've noticed I don't think you need it. You're naturally jolly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, again, uh, this, this is this is clear messaging from number ten, isn't it? it We're going to tackle antisocial. Yes, I mean basically they're lining up all the issues for the, so the next election. Most of the front pages, it's like a press and, release, and, all, and all of yeah, all of this, all of this cracking down on antisocial behaviour. Of course, we want to crack down on antisocial behaviour, but I haven't really heard anything from the Conservatives or from Labour, which is convinces me that it, that it's ever going to happen. Um, and frankly, there aren't enough police to do this. Uh, in most places. I mean, there aren't enough police to deal with serious crimes. Well, they're most that's, I think that's too the, that's busy on the online hate crimes. That's why the police are going wrong. Or taking the knee or things like that. I think part of the problem well, is that... Um, <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not discussing whether, whether one should take the knee or not. I'm saying there's been so much um, sort of airspace given to the fact that they've been involved in lots of bandwagon-y type sort of bleeding yep. heart causes, as opposed to neighbourhood policing, which has broken down. We don't have local um, police stations anymore. We don't have bobbies on the beat. So all these initiatives are great, but like you say, who's going to actually bring them into effect? I mean, it's, nitrous oxide's not the stuff you have when you're having a baby. Is that a different thing? Mark, I think it's quite funny. I think, I, I, I think, think it's know, gas I, I, Actually, I should ask uh, my team about that. Like, I'm not <laughs> sure if it's, it's a say. I mean, I remember breathing something in when we had my two sons. Yeah. Um, and it put me in a good place. But, but yeah, me too. Th with this <laughs> laughing gas, it's horrible. Because for those that are listening or watching don't know, it's those little metal canisters that you see yes. on the street. Yeah. Yeah. And they are a scourge. And it's not nice for people uh, to take the kids to the park, go for a walk with the dog and see people inhaling this stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's a broken society, it really is. Yeah. Um, OK, well, look, let's move on now to NHS chiefs, Adrian. Sound alarm on spiralling staff shortages. Uh, the crisis continues. Calls for radical homegrown recruitment drive to avoid a shortfall of half a million NHS staff within the next 13 years. Yeah. Oh, dear. Don't well, get this... ill anytime soon. Well, you know, this story is, is, is one aspect of the NHS. We could go into whole areas of, of the whole issue of the NHS. Um, we've got the staff shortage problem, people are sick, we've got the uh, mm. huge obesity problem, excess deaths are higher than they have been for many years or for four or five years. We need the staff and, you know, I, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm pro sort of controlling immigration, but if we need the staff, if we need fruit pickers, if we need nurses, if we need porters and Brits don't want to do the work, then we have to recruit from overseas. And Angela Epstein, that is the tension, isn't there? There's a clear link between economic growth and levels of migration, but the public want to cut the numbers, but it could impact the economy and, as we're seeing here, Public, uh, public health and, and public services. Yeah, I mean, the, look, it's been the old adage that the, it's the jobs went to, the, to, uh, to people who... The, there were jobs that we didn't want to do. Mm. You know, the, the classic situation, the demographic was very clearly that. I mean, there are lots of problems with, with recruitment within the NHS, not just from the, the kind of shop floor jobs, right up through, you know, all the scales of, of medicine. If you talk to... My, my son's a young doctor. If you talk to those looking for their advanced training, for their specialist training, there are so many doctors competing for so few specialists specialty posts, which is ridiculous, because we need these posts and we need the expertise. But, but the none of you, you're, are... all, you're all free marketeers, but none of you have discussed pay yet. Doesn't it well, occur to you that actually, if you pay people a lot less than they were earning 15 years ago, if you pay junior doctors 35% less than they were earning uh, 15 years ago, um, then... Uh, is it any surprise that... Uh, and it's that, the same yeah, in education. I don't think. Yeah, yeah, it's the exactly, same in schools. Exactly. So why but are medical schools oversubscribed? There are so many capable young people who apply for medical schools who don't get positions uh, at the medical school. So it's, it's not... It, well, I don't it, think it, that's because, the driving well, factor it, it for going into It may well be medicine. because the medical schools aren't, aren't big enough, but we are still taking far too many people from overseas. And the long-term answer to this is to train our doctors and nurses in this country from the, the existing population rather than taking, relying on foreign uh, labour from overseas all the time and depleting the health services of many, of the, of, of many parts of the developed But perhaps world. if the NHS paid less to EDI, I think it's 8,000 people, and the waste in that NHS and paid more to the doctors and nurses, that would half solve the problem. 
paid, but, but 8,000 people working on EDI. I think it's it? that figures, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, it, I'm not sure even if you were to get rid of all of those people, it would make a huge amount of But the doctors, well, the junior doctors want 35%. Well, where that, is, yes, but, but where is the money? But they get back to where they were. Where's the money supposed to come from? I agree with you. It's a really hard yeah, job yeah, yeah, yeah. being a junior doctor. Yeah, it's yeah. A I wouldn't want to do it, yeah, but yeah. where does the yeah. money well, come from? Well, there has from? to be a long-term commitment to get that pay, those pay levels back because people are leaving in their droves. And, and, and do, you, you know, do you want to give up on the health service? Do you want to say, right, will everybody have to sort themselves out? Or do you actually want to preserve the health service, restore it to its, its previous health? Uh, and pay people properly. Uh, coming up, we've got lots more stories from the papers with my amazing pundits tonight. I think you'll agree we're travelling business class with Adrian <laughs> and, of course, uh, Michael and Angela. Uh, we'll be looking at the scandal of over 800 sewage spills a day. Uh, plus, should private schools be clobbered with VAT? Uh, is that a better way to make our society more equal? Is it appropriate to breastfeed in a swimming pool? And we'll discuss who Scotland's first minister is going to be. That's tomorrow. Plus, we've got the mail coming as well. Don't go anywhere. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. More front pages, and I think we've got the mail now. Let's have a look at what the mail newspaper are leading with. Sex offenders let off crimes just by saying sorry. An absolute scandal on the front page of the mail. Um, speaking of scandal, let's have a look at the front page of the Times. Over 800 sewage spills a day. Water firms to publish real-time data in a victory for the Times newspaper's campaign to clean up 
Britain's sea and seas and riverways. Your reaction to this horrible story, Adrian? Well, I take my hat off for the Times for highlighting this because <clears throat> I've been saying for quite a few years now, or a couple of years, mm. is all these other environmental issues, I'm coming from an environmentalist, all these environmental issues, which are serious, are being sacrificed on the altar of the quasi-religion that is net zero. And they're being ignored, they're being, whether it's resource depletion, whether it's deforestation, whether it's sewage problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd love to see Just Stop Oil protesters putting their placards, putting Just Stop Sewage and gluing themselves to the River Test in Hampshire, where I live. And, uh, and perhaps we can have some more, you know, more publicity and more campaigns against these, un these hidden environmental issues which are being ignored. I do think the Green lobby are guilty of double standards. Uh, a woman was breastfeeding her baby in the swimming pool this week. A pool attendant asked her to move closer to a filter, you know, where the drain is, in case the baby was sick. She claimed it was discrimination. So it begs the question, should women breastfeed in swimming pools? Angela, you've got kids? Definitely. I, I breastfed all, all my children, not recently. And, um, and I think just because it is a wonderfully natural thing, if you can do it, not all women can, they have issues with it, uh, it can give a baby a fantastic start. It's a lovely, intimate thing to do. All the things that, that are probably very well documented. It doesn't mean that it is your absolute right to do it anywhere, anyhow, that you please, just mm. because it's all of those things. I think when you're in a public place, I think you have to have consideration for everybody around you. I think you have to have consideration uh, for, for the baby, for you, and not to sort of take on this bloody-minded approach to say, because, you know, breast is best and it's mother's pride and it's great a thing to do, that I can do this anywhere I want. I don't think that... I think we have to be sensitive to everybody else around us as well. Swimming pool is a public place. Other people are using it. Yes, the baby might have projectile vomiting. It might just have a bit of reflux. I don't want to swim in a pool with breast milk in. You know, that... And, and I'm, I'm a great believer in breastfeeding. I think it's absolutely selfish when women do but that. But what about the House of Commons? Who was the Labour MP? Stella Creasy. <laughs> Stella Creasy, yes. Which I thought, you know, perhaps a baby could projectile vomit over the House I of Commons. Right. That might be quite suitable. But, uh, but yes, is it a suitable place? I think it's rather, look at me and my baby. Breastfeeding, have you given this much thought, Michael? <laughs> I haven't, but I agree with Angela on this. It seems to me that, well, from what I've observed of breastfeeding, um, it, uh, it, it can be quite a messy business. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't think we want the, the, the surplus milk in the pool. No, we don't. But I think the other yeah. thing is, very quickly, I would say, yeah. is that breastfeeding mothers, they've become very militant. I heard them regard... They've been called, no, called the... Breast Starpo, which is very unfortunate. <laughs> and they take what they call brelfies, which is pictures of themselves breastfeeding their babies. They do it to be bloody-minded and say, because breast is best, I'm going to do it anyway without considering other and people. I've no problem with, the, with, with breastfeeding in all sorts of other places. I just think in this particular instance, uh, it's, it's going... Where, 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 where would you draw the line? Costa Coffee, uh, the Sir Alex Ferguson stand at Manchester United? Well, that's, that's fine by me. But, um, <laughs> it, because, you know, it doesn't create a mess that goes all over yeah. other... People. OK, that's fair enough, and I can't, trouble can't, can't disagree with that. No, no, listen, <laughs> no-one gets cancelled on my watch, Michael, let me tell you. Um, research you the, worried about it. I know, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> research from the Independent Schools Council shows that if VAT on school fees is introduced under a Labour government, 25% of independent school pupils will move to the state sector. Keir Starmer and Labour plan to uh, put VAT on private schools. So uh, what do we think? Could it backfire? Michael? I think it could, because... Uh, I think the 25% figure is a bit high. Mm. Uh, you know, it might be 10, 15% uh, who would go to the state sector. But in certain areas, like inner London or parts of Manchester, that would put a severe strain on the state schools. They would have to open new classrooms, build new classrooms and all of that. There's another factor as well, which is that these schools, in order to maintain their charitable status, have to do all sorts of good works, like... Um, allowing, you know, encouraging some of their teachers, some of their pupils to help out at state schools, state That's schools right. that may not do, say, Latin or Greek, say, um, and... Share sports, facilities sports, as well, sports, sports, assisted sports, places, yeah. yeah. All of those things. And if they're not... If they're no longer chari regarded as charitable, they may be... And so we're not going to do that. Uh, we're not also thinking about parents. You know, not all parents who send their kids to, to public schools and private schools are posh-loaded people. They are, they're often people who think, I'm working really hard and I want to spend my money on giving 
giving my child the best education they can get? And why should they suddenly be priced out of the market? You know, it's the politics of envy, and I absolutely hate that kind and of thing. And very quickly, Mark, we're struggling with state schools, hospitals, staffing, everything. You put, to, you put a, another factor in that's going to make it even worse. It's going to backfire. There you go. Uh, listen, folks, uh, tonight didn't backfire. What a thrill to have Michael Crick, Adrian Hayes and Angela Epstein. Brilliant pundits tonight. We'll do it all again on Friday at 8. Headliners is next. Good evening. My name's Rachel Ayres and welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. Now looking ahead to next week, it'll be quite a cold start tomorrow but becoming increasingly settled and this is due to an area of high pressure that's going to make its way in from the northwest to become centred over the UK by the time we get to Monday morning, clearing away that low pressure we've seen over the weekend. But back to tonight and we'll see some showers around northern and eastern coasts in particular through this evening. But cloud will start to quite readily break up, allowing for quite a harsh and widespread frost across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. And we could see some icy stretches to start Monday down eastern coasts. Now looking further south and there will be a patchy frost around and maybe the odd bit of mist and fog too as well as the odd shower but this will clear through Monday morning to leave a fine dry for many and bright day with plenty of lengthy sunny intervals throughout the day. There will be a bit more in the way of cloud in the south and west but there will be some sunny spells too and within these it will be feeling quite pleasant even though temperatures won't be much higher than what we've seen today. As we go into Monday evening and with those clear spells around, a frost will start to form down northern and eastern coasts in particular. Now looking further west, we've got the next low pressure system making its way in from the Atlantic, bringing in increased cloud cover and outbreaks of rain as well. So here temperatures will actually rise through the night, but as we get to Tuesday morning we could still have a patchy frost further north and east. Through Tuesday morning we will see that cloud and rain making its way northwards and eastwards and this could bring some hill snow too, particularly over Scotland we might just see a touch of snow over northern England too. And that really sets the theme for the rest of the week with unsettled weather not going too far away but milder temperatures too, especially from midweek. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years, I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. 